I, oh. Okay, I'm going to talk about this show uh, today, which I put on at a fringe festival in New Zealand and Auckland. And would you guys mind moving over yeah, sure. here? Sure. That I like, can look in one direction. Like, yeah, sure. that would be cool. Thanks. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a rumor. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I put this show on in the French Festival in February in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, and so basically, what I wanted to do was create a two hour mini ARG, and which basically went through the streets of Wellington. These are, this is where it went. Um, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm not bringing for you, what is the ARG? An uh, alternate reality game. Okay. So basically what I wanted to do was take some interactive, uh, my ideas about interactivity and actually see if they worked. So this was kind of like the lab experiment, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, these are, yeah, so basically it, we ended up, uh, I ended up taking, it was eight people at a time because I wanted to make, I wanted to make a really personalized experience and I found out that that was what, um, that was something that I really enjoyed. Um, and I took them through what was, if you walked the, the actual route, it takes you 20 minutes. I wasn't sure how long the show would actually take. Um, it ended up taking two hours. So, that group of eight people. Group of eight people. Eight people per night. Okay. Because, hi. Because basically, because I basically I sort through every idea that I could think of at it, and um, I just wanted to see if it would work. And I'm really glad that we had eight people a night because it would have been pretty crazy otherwise. So, um, actually, go back to the uh, yeah this poster. Um, as part of the French festival, you basically have to you have to create the poster really early, um, and so I had this beautiful poster, and I didn't have a show for you know <laughs> about two months after the poster was sort of out there and finished, and that was a slightly nerve wracking time. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, on the yeah the tagline is "Are you up for saving the world?" And um, on the back of the flyer, I had the line, are you bold enough? And basically, people were telling me, you know, don't put, are you bold enough? What if people aren't bold and they won't come? And I'm kind of saying, well, actually, those are the people I want to not come. Because what I, because I was actually creating an experience that required a very active, brave audience to do things that they'd never done before. And it could have gone horribly wrong if the wrong people had come. And so I, I was actually sort of self-selecting the audience members that I wanted to come, um, yeah, without actually knowing if that was going to pan out. And it, so another part of what I did to actually, I had the advertising out there that was hopefully that was telling people that it was going to be an active, interactive experience and that they were going to be challenged. Um, I've got a flyer in my bag for the show actually that I'll um, pull out later. Um, and then as part of making, creating this boldness in people, I, was, I started texting them at 8am on the morning of the show. So I had the theatre collect their phone numbers um, and then I texted them individually by name you know, good morning, Victoria. You know, welcome to Frequency. Uh, please, uh, please uh, make this, put this number in your phone as resist a command. And um, then I asked people to, um, I, I, I sent them a self, I asked them to reply with copy that. So I was immediately kind of getting them sort of to obey. Um, and then I sent them, a, I asked them to rate themselves on initiative, problem solving and leadership. And out of 10, I got that reply and then I sent them back a, um, a text saying, congratulations, you and one other audience member have been selected 
to, uh, to be as prime agent material and you will be evaluated tonight. Here is your code name. Here is a secret code phrase that you will be required to exchange with another audience member. Um, you will be privately instructed when that is going to happen. So people got all this in the morning and I had a lot of feedback from people that they were excited all day about the show as a result. And this was also, I was wanting to kind of prime them subconsciously that they were going to be challenged. And you know, here's a secret that you can have all day. You know, so you know, so you're already feeling a little bit like a secret agent. So and then when they got to the um, to the theatre, there there was a table and on it um, there were a series of envelopes with the code with each person's code name on them. Um, and how long was it before, from the time that you started texting them to the actual theatre when they all met? Um, I started texting them at eight in the morning. Um, the show was a seven pm show. Oh. Wow. So basically, they were just a, they got three or four texts in quick succession between about eight and eight thirty in the morning, and then nothing until they turned up to the show. So they um, and then um, so then while they were while they were um, sitting around waiting for something to happen, someone arrived and he was looking for his missing girlfriend. And was just, Actor, and this was the, initial, the beginning of the show. He showed her photo, he talked about this mysterious organisation that she was involved with, had anyone seen her. Um, and uh, then he left, and um, then, the, then one of the audience members would scratch his neck, we put a mole in the audience to make sure that nothing went terribly wrong. Um, he would scratch his neck. Front house would see that and text me. I was at the final location. I had a Bluetooth keyboard and an iPhone. The entire thing was done through that. Um, so then I then made a phone call and a phone that was taped underneath the table rang. And, <laughs> and so when they found the phone, um, the uh, a mysterious code phrase came through, but then there was a hang up and texts started coming through and that the texts were a conversation between some Agent 5 and Sister Command. And we'd already set up um, when the actor came through initially that um, that there were really strange things going on in the world and um, emails aren't arriving at their destination and microwaves are playing music and have you guys noticed any of this weird stuff? So we kind of set it up in the theme of the show. Um, the story world was a science fiction world in which there's a, a people from a parallel universe called the Miners who were coming to our world and mining our radio frequencies and we're on the verge of frequency collapse, which is why um, emails and texts are going to the wrong location and so on. And what happened, um, so this conversation was coming through Resist a command and Agent 5 were trying to contact each other, and then suddenly there's this text that's like a cat whipped across the keyboard, and then Agent 5 starts calling for help, and then sends a bloodstained map through. And then the bloodstained map goes to through to every audience member and he calls for help, and that is of course their cue to leave. Um, they also have um, Oh uh, yeah, before you before you did that, um, that they uh, they open their envelopes and they have a series of assignments that they carry with them. Um, and the first assignment is to exchange their secret code phrase, and they then find out who the other person is in the audience that they're exchanging phrases with, and they will be exchanging secret phrases with them throughout the experience. Um, and so what? Yeah, originally this was going to be a much more passive show and it was basically going to be people were going to be walking around the streets reading text messages and text conversations. Um, and then I had technical issues because I was using Mighty Text to send texts and when we did a, a technical test, a bunch of texts just didn't arrive. And so I decided I had to be a lot less reliant on texting. And I but I needed people to give people something to do. So they, um, it, 
at various points in the experience, they are told, they, they are given a question like, um, you, you prefer to improvise rather than have a clearly defined plan. If this is true, use the word twilight in a conversation with your partner. If this is false, use the word dawn in a conversation with your partner. They will reply using the same word. And the, the other person is told, your partner is about to use the word twilight or the, the word dawn in a conversation, um, reply using the same word, but they're not told why this person is going to use that word. So. Um, so they walk, they walk through, through the streets following with this bloodstained map and they find a wound, a live actor um, in a van behind at the end of this lane um, and they recognise the logo on the van which is, has been shown to them by the actor in the original scene. And, um, so they all go together as a group? They all go together as a group, okay. yeah. Basically I, what I was trying to do throughout the show was create a sense of group bonding and I gave them a few kind of gently silly things to do that I figured would be fun as a group, would be no fun by yourself but in the safety of numbers would be fun. Um, we did actually have on one occasion, so I was texting them in character, I also had um, a crew member called the Invisible Witness whose job it was to follow them and to report back to me in real time what they were doing. So this was very much the lo-fi, low-tech way to do things. So I could respond to what they were doing. So if someone, oh. you know, was lagging behind, I'd go, hurry up, don't lag behind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so yeah, that was your checks and balances for the, for the game. You had someone kind of watching them. I had someone watching right. them. So I had, um, I was sitting in the final location, which was a truck. I was sitting in the front of the truck. I had a Bluetooth keyboard in front of me. I had a phone that I was um, texting on. And I, what I did before the show was I actually sent the entire show's worth of texts to another phone. So I actually had more than my sent folder. So I could just forward the texts. So I was, oh, okay. yeah, so, yeah, so some texts were, I was writing yeah, manually, was. but, you know, it was way, way more efficient and faster to, you know, have all these sent texts, just good to go. So, um, when these guys got to the, uh, actually, yeah, the van, which was parked beyond, behind the office house, <coughs> this is one of those um, situations <coughs> where something you think will be easy is actually incredibly difficult, because that's what I was about to say to you, most difficult, thing I did in the show was get a parking space. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so there's this, you know, there's this space behind the opera house, there are parking spaces there, they're almost never used, but then it's a matter of dealing with the council. No, we won't rent out these spaces. No, we won't tell you who's renting these spaces. And so I ended up walking around the streets asking the businesses, do you rent one of these spaces? And I finally found um, a, a shoe shop that said, yeah, absolutely, you can use our space. And this is like after three weeks of kind of going, oh my God, I'm going to have to reroute the entire show so I won't be able to go down this cool lane. So, um, and then once they got to the, um, so that's the resistor symbol for the, um, and the, there's the wounded agent inside the van. Um, they then needed to give him pills and bandage him up. He'd been shot by a ray gun. Um, he then gives them a puzzle um, that he needs to solve, and he and he then ne he then needs to communicate and <laughs> solve that puzzle to Resistor Commander. And he asks, of course, he asks the audience if they can do it because he's too weak, um, and he's obviously he's too weak to reach his first aid pack as well. <laughs> so he sends them off. Um, Uh, uh, yes, and they also see in the van, they see a wanted poster for a resistor agent who is the missing girlfriend of the guy in the original scene. So they realise that this is what she's um, getting involved with. So who's, who's taking the picture? Yeah, the, 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 people, the, the people that are playing, or is it someone that's actually taking the pictures? Of the, the These band? pictures? Yeah. Uh, I had a professional photographer follow the audience. Okay. For, yeah. uh, <laughs> Following them was really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so I told him to, to say that, you know, he, he was one of the surveillance agents. Uh, so just yeah. to kind of... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so there was, so in total there were nine people wandering around? There were nine people. Okay, so yeah, that was also, um, I was told, I was actually going to advertise it as a show for nine people. The French festival said, no, no, nine's a funny number. Say ten. So I said ten, which ended up being, you know, kind of a, a dumb decision, I think. Um, but yeah, so so basically, there were, it was kind of a lie. It was always going to be a lie about how big the audience was because there always had to be an undercover mole. We had the same guy throughout the whole run, which was really good because, of course, he got up to up to speed with what to expect and. Um, but the mole was something from the photographer, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the mole actually had the most challenging job because he was basically on through the entire show. We had three actors in the show, apart from him, um, and they each only had quite brief scenes. So he had the most... Like, like this guy that was, that was injured? Yeah. yeah, the guy who was injured, he had one ten minute scene. Yeah. Um, and so they I get sent down sort of around the corner and they're told to wait at here and they're waiting expecting that to, sh to show up and then the phone box rings. Oh. And, <laughs> and this is an example of something that you think would be difficult but is actually easy. It was much easier to get. I don't know if, if phone, bo phone boxes ring in the States if you can ring to a phone box. You can. If, I, if you can find them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's weird right but you, you actually you can't do that in New Zealand. And yeah. so, you know, they're all kind of blocked. And so I, I, I think the show was based on no one. Yeah, because there were, you know, a lot of people say that that was their favourite part of the show and that they'd always wanted that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, in New Zealand, this is something you've only ever seen in American movies, the phone boxes ring. And, you know, our phone boxes don't ring. So basically, I rang Telecom, New Zealand Telecom, and, this, and once I found the guy who was in charge of phone boxes, I said, can I do this for a theatre show? Yeah, absolutely, no problem. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah, so basically, um, he's also given them um, a, code, a code phrase. So they pick up the phone and they hear nine birds fly home, which is a phrase. They then need to say seeking shelter. They say that. It's me on the other end of the phone. I resist a command. So I go, where's Agent 5? What's happened to him? Oh, he's, a, he's wounded. He couldn't make it. One night someone said he's resting. And I was thinking, what? No, oh, he's been shot before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the rest of the audience were going, no, no, no. And someone took the phone off this person. And one night, actually, there was some, someone said, um, are you really resist a command? Prove you resist a command. You need to send us a text proving that you're a resist a command, or I won't believe that you are who you say you are. I did not plan for this. <laughs> And I'm also talking to the guy on the same phone that I've been sending texts on. So, oh, I, no. I, actually, so I, can, I need to speak to another training agent. <laughs> and I heard the audience go, ooh. <laughs> so um, they then get, um, uh, they then have to deliver the, the, um, the, oh, I should say, if you have any questions, I don't know if I said this at the beginning, feel free to jump in. Um, they then get given the dead drop number. Uh, they, they then give the um, they give resistor command the dead drop number, and resistor command says, "Okay, I, I need you. Can you please go and pick up this package since Agent Five can't do it? Are you willing to take the risk?" Yes, yes, we're willing to take the risk. <laughs> <laughs> and and then stand by for transmission, and they get sent a picture um, that is a reasonably cryptic map. Well, not that cryptic, but you know, a map that with an X on it. And they then go to this location and they then have to find the dead drop, which is, you can see it in this picture, but you have to look really hard. And that's it there. So, <laughs> nice. yeah. so I'll just go back there. It's on the, the middle post there. It's basically a magnetic box that sticks on and there's a note inside it. Nice. So what happens, this is, yeah, so what happens is when they start, when they get close to it, the invisible witness tells me that, you know, okay, they're getting close, and I go, you know, um, 
dead rock location detected, you know, and so I'm, <laughs> I'm basically telling them, you know, in you can time. start looking now, and yeah, in real time. Um, and so, and this is also a time that obviously it's crucial to have a mole, because otherwise the entire thing could be over now if they couldn't find, find it. And so if they, if they take too long, then the mole finds it. And this is, this is something that I still actually haven't, um, this is something I haven't fully solved yet because we had a few sort of, um, a, a few hunts for things. Um, and I don't quite know how, you know, the tipping point between this is fun and where the hell is this thing, I'm over this, I just want to move on. You know, how to actually judge that. But I think, you know, really having a mole is probably the only way to be sure that you can judge that right. Um, so... Is, is there a risk where, you know, like, you know, you're hiding something? You. There is a risk. Yes, there is a risk. And I, that risk happened uh -oh. in the very next thing, and I'll tell you about that. Okay, so this, um, this woman here is wanted, so this is what they found. And um, it's a it's an image of um, if you know Wellington, you will recognise the diagram. It's an image of uh, this ball, which is just around the corner, and um, there's, there's a note from the secret agent with it, and saying there's a data cloud underneath the ball, and she's going to investigate it. And so off they go to the ball, and um, they are getting they're getting messages from me, and this is another key invisible witness timing thing, data cloud detected, um, signal insufficient, um, you know, elevate device to receive transmission. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and a lot of people said this was their most fun thing. Really? Fun thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, so I'm sending a lot of messages, you know, um, you know, uh, tra transmission unclear, you know, higher. <laughs> So, um, and you know, and I'm talking to the invisible witness as well, and go, do they all have their hands in the air? Okay, cool. <laughs> and they all did, they were really, this is one of the places where I was thinking New Zealanders were, were a shy nation, and I wasn't sure if people were going to be willing to do this, but they totally loved it and got into it. Um, they then received a couple of texts, um, a couple of texts in the data cloud from the missing agent, and as they are going to go through the experience, they actually, most of what they find are notes from her as she was investigating the miners who were, and, and some of the notes are in reverse order, so they kind of look like flashbacks. Um, so she, she talks about what her next step is, and she also says there's a quantum light on the screen, one hidden in the dead drop in, in Civic Square. Dead drop 6581 or whatever. So they know that they need to look for um, a, a dead drop in this square. Um, and this is the thing that went missing one night because we had a large crew but not large enough to keep eyes on every object throughout the entire show. We had people, people were kind of going through and placing clues just before the audience arrived but we still didn't have enough people to keep eyes on them. And on one occasion they were taking a really long time to find it. I was going, what's going on? What's going on? And um, it turned out, for some bizarre reason, it wasn't where it had been left, but it was under a, a, under a bench where it was supposed to be, but it was under a different bench. So some member of the public must have picked it up and moved it. I can, and you know, this was something that had um, a note inside it saying, they are taking energy through the quantum, quantum rift from our world. And so someone looked at me, oh, okay, I'll just put this under a different bench. Just one of those mysteries. <laughs> And so um, there was a torch in there um, that is the quantum light on the scrambler. It's actually a UV torch that will, will be used to read an invisible ink note later on. So um, the, they are told that the next um, message is in the pyramid energy trap, which is, that was the most obvious clue of all. Um, and they are then sent to get another Another message. This was a slight. This was a. Um, I felt like this was a repeated beat, but I was also sort of working with the location, you know. So I kind of walked through the location before I wrote the show and kind of went, okay, what is interesting to 
do. You know, I kind of walked through what I thought was the most attractive part of Wellington and found places to hide things or, you know, kind of thought, how can I use these spaces? And so they were... Um, did they ever need a drive to get to other locations? No, no. it was all walking along. Do you have um, trouble with... Uh, because some places just don't have it. There actually, we did have trouble with cellular, cellular connection. Um, the area in the permit energy trap actually turned out to be a cell phone dead black yeah. hole. <laughs> so, Maybe you're on something there. <laughs> so basically, so and this is why, um, yeah, I actually had a four-day period of emergency rewrite of the show um, wow. when I. And this is when the, the interactive um, word games, when I put them into the show, and I actually think it became a much better show as a result, because originally it was going to be much more passive, people were just going to be walking around, kind of almost like reading a book, reading conversations, but instead they actually were interacting with each other. Um, oh, and they also had, I've got to say, they also had at the beginning, they had an evaluation form, they were told they were going to be evaluating their fellow training agent. Um, and that they were going to evaluate them on engagement with the task and naturalness of code word delivery. I mean, evaluating on engagement with the task, you will be tested on how into this show you are. <laughs> you know? So, um, so, in the yeah. beginning, you asked people to evaluate themselves on problem solving initiatives yes. and leadership, and there's other areas where you sort of focus in on individual ability. Did that get tied into the activities in some way other than the year? No, that was really, that was bogus. Uh -huh. um, that was, that, you know, that was, I mean, I would love to, yeah. but that was, was outside of the, the reality of the scope of what I could achieve, uh -huh. basically. Uh -huh. So that was really, the focus of that was to get them to feel that it was personalized, yeah. that we cared, we cared about them. Um, yeah, and to make them feel just a little bit vulnerable, actually. Uh -huh. And also, you know, when they evaluated them, and then they get told, congratulations, you have been chosen, yeah. you know, they will then feel special. Yeah. And of course it's a lie because everyone has been chosen. Um, <laughs> I, and I'm also told, do not inform other audience members, part of the evaluation is about your discretion. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'll never know all the ramifications of, you know, who told what to who. Um, yeah, and originally I start, I, I was pairing people up with people they hadn't come with. But then we had a few issues with that with people who were late to the show. So I finally, I actually realised it was just much, it was much better to just pair people with the people that they were coming with. It was, yeah. And I think people felt more comfortable exchanging code words as well. Um, so at this point, um, they get sent a photo of, they, they get told that there is a dangerous agent out there who's attacked someone and uh, the other agent um, his life has been saved by some passing training agents, so they get told that they've saved this guy's life. Um, and then they get sent the picture of the attacker, and it's the guy who was looking for his girlfriend at the beginning. So, um, and they are then they then have another. Um, they then uh, they then get sent to find another box. Um, there is a there is an interworld message being delivered and um, it's this is the and so they then get a blank piece of paper um, and they've got their uh, they're told that they need to unscramble the message and so that's just you know like a slight puzzle that they realise that the quantum light unscrambler can um, yeah. you know if they shine it at the paper. You've um, tied. Sorry? Uh, we we've done something similar where you use tied on a piece of paper because it's black light responsive uh, and we're using a UV light it causes the yeah. tide like so tied. Oh, tied, right, yeah. So, oh, and yeah. like those pens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, that was, that's yeah. clever. Yeah, so, the, yeah. I mean, I bought this uh, pen in like a toy shop. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of pen. Um, and so it turns out that um, the missing agent is trapped inside the quantum rift. And she's sending, she's um, sent an emergency call for help. And she's going, um, she's sending them a track and it will enable them to find the quantum rift. And so the next part of the show is about finding the tracker. And um, they then get sent to the, to the harbour. Um, they're told that um, they will be sent to the bilateral communicator stations. Um, so here are, 
who are people with bilateral communicator stations. Um, so originally we were going to, um, I was actually going to have a toy boat and the boat was going to arrive and there was going to be an augmented reality video thing on the boat. I'm sure you can imagine why that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there were so many things that could have gone wrong with that, like a boat can sink. Um, and there was a lot of magic reality. It, it ended up going in the two part basket. But this was another time when I feel like a problem actually ended up making the show better. Like I think people had much more fun doing a semaphore than they would have um, just, you know, passively watching an augmented reality video. Um, you did a really good job making do silly things. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and getting it photographed. Getting yeah. it photographed. Yeah. So and actually what happened with the semaphore as well was it began with the play testing, it was real semaphore, and people found it was really taking a really long time and people were sending the wrong letters and they were kind of getting stuck at that part of the show. So uh, I mean, and actually an audience member, you know, for the play testing suggested why don't you have one word per symbol instead of one letter and the first time we go, that's not real semaphore. And then it's like, well, okay, fine, fine, this is what needs to happen. So it became simplified and then it became simplified even again because, yeah, people, also there were a lot of people, I thought semaphore was easy, but apparently it's not, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, like if you hold your arm slightly off, then it will seem like a different letter. So, um, actually, so in this scene you can see, so this guy has the clue, um, and this woman is showing this guy what to do. Because, you know, that kind of, it's like, okay, which round, way round is this? Okay, we have to turn around, you know, kind of do the mirror image of what the thing is. So they're all involved, because they, yes, they're split up into two, groups of four at this point on opposite sides of the lagoon. So this was not, like the way of using the lagoon that wasn't the boat, essentially. So what they, they, they send each other a, a very simple message and they, they then have to tell resistor command what the message is, um, send tracker code, send tracker location of the two messages, and then they each get sent a photo that is, and when you put the photo together, they then get sent to this bike, yeah. which is, um, they get a photo of the bike, and there's a padlock on the bike, they get a photo of the combination lock. And so you, they can actually, when they see the photo of the bike, you know, they look around, it's like, oh my god, it's over there. So, um, and inside... Yeah, I'm mean, just asking about yes. the so, Yes. So what happened? They, you, you split them into two groups? Of yes. So um, it was. Um, I, I, so I named them. They all they all had the code names of quantum physicists that I got from Wikipedia, and um, so I so Dirac, Dyson, Schrödinger, um, Hilbert go to gamma location, and they so they get sent maps. And then why couldn't they just find each other up? Um, they did at some points. I think when they were having trouble, right. but um, they. Why they couldn't phone each other up is they don't have each other's phone numbers. I've got all their phone numbers, but they don't have each other's unless there's people in the same group who, you know, who came together. Who no, I'm just saying because it sounds like they, yeah. you managed to create an atmosphere where they kind of willingly went along with it. Yeah. So usually, it's so yeah. So like your phones are, you know, are unusable in this area. Or anything yeah. Like no. No. Yeah, when, when you have to looking for specific things in a location, yes. do, you, do you consider using like? Uh, that it did not No. Um, they were, these were very small things. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, it was more about just having, yeah, I wouldn't know how to do that to be oh, honest. Okay. They, they, um, they, they, they do this thing called Munzee, and they say okay. it's like the same thing like where they give you a coordinate, but then like, instead okay. of looking for boxes, it's like these little like AR codes. Or like, okay. you know, it's, it's AR code, right? I don't remember, I've done something where you, you just try to go to a, Coordinates on your, on your yeah, then you look around for it, and then like AR code, you beep, though you got it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I forgot to say that you know the code words that they were exchanging, like so, they have four sh um, four code word exchanges throughout the show, and they get more difficult as the show goes on. Like the first three are quite quite straightforward, like use the word traffic or use the word pedestrians. 
in a conversation. And then it ends up with use the word minuet or fandango, you know, or giraffe or toaster, you know. So, um, okay, so when they open up the bike, they find this case inside and um, they, they have found a key. And when they, one of the things they found in the pyramid energy track was a key. And so the key opens the case and inside the case, is a um, it, uh, is a fold where they have to put their evaluations of each other, and um, they they really had some fun filling them out actually because uh, some of the things they okay they were they put the evaluations in the case and then they do an exchange um, with a crew member. So it was a case exchange. Um, so one person gets to deliver this case, um, and they draw they draw straws in order to um, decide who's going to do it. Because I was concerned that there might be one pushy person who might spoil it for everyone else who was going to do all the fun stuff. And I did this with the semaphore as well. I said if there is more than one volunteer, use the traditional resistor protocol of fist victory surrender. First victory surrender. So, you know, known to, known to civilians as rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> so, so, each time there was a fun thing, I just made sure that, yeah, that any pushy person couldn't grab it. And apparently, yeah, that drawing straws for this, people really enjoyed it. Because I, I had this case that, you know, had a foam base, and then I cut like a tiny little piece out of it, and I had the straws right in the center of the case, like, to da you know, sort of big presentation here in the straws, sort of thing. And um, the audience evaluation forms, the, this is a point where the audience actually kind of created, almost created a story beat for themselves, because I was imagining that they were going to fill in the forms as they went. But of course they didn't, they were busy, they were doing the show. So at this point they would stop, and there was a cafe without your tables, and they would all just sit down at the, at the cafe and fill out their forms. And I also left a, um, I said, do you have any other comments on your on your fellow candidate. And here are some of the quotes. Um, and you can sort of tell that people were getting into the spirit of things. Um, distractible, unresponsive to code, but keen as mustard if naive. <laughs> nice eyes. She was the most into it at first and over the top excited by payphone call. <laughs> Dry wit, most entertaining. She's lovely, I'd sleep with her. <laughs> Great guy, and his it, Sylvia was the name of the missing agent. If it was up to me, Sylvia would be dead. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I'm not sure if they were saying that they found her a really annoying character, or they just felt that they weren't very. So Sylvia actually showed up at the end. At the end. Yeah, yeah. I um, mean, someone rated their part of five out of five for everything, and then wrote, "Too good to be true." Hippies are an average three, not five. Definitely unsuitable. <laughs> If they were being asked if they would recommend um, their partner as a resistor agent. Um, so we had, yeah, we only had one audience member problem. This was um, devised as a result. Um, so basically, we had one guy on one night who just wanted to screw with the show. Who knows why? Um, like in the very first scene, when this guy walks in and he says, I'm looking for my girlfriend, she's missing, he says, I shot her. <laughs> what do you do with that? You know, and apparently he kept, he kept trying to derail the show throughout, and I actually got a really pissed off actor coming to me in the truck saying, We have an audience member who needs to be thrown off the show. And I, so I texted them all, said, Does someone need to be removed? And he went, no, no, it's no, no, it's fine. Um, everyone's fine. And then, sort of three minutes later, I got direct is the dickhead. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And I offered to remove him from the show, but the mole wanted to kind of work with him. So we got through the through the show. The actors were kind of really looking shell shocked by the end of the show. And so I went away. I kind of went, okay, how can I make sure this never happens again? So I came up with a three-stage jerk extraction protocol, 
printed this out, gave everyone a copy of it the following night. And so basically it was a three level code. Um, so basically level one, you know, in terms of how bad their behavior is. So, so I get told, if I get told level one, I text them in character. This would have really helps to have everyone's phone numbers. I text them in character and basically tell them subtly to stop doing whatever it is they're doing. If it's level two, I bring them. This is Leone Reynolds, I'm the director of this show. You need to stop doing whatever. Stop torturing the actors with lit cigarettes, whatever. Um, if it's level three, that's immediate extraction. And so what happens then is you have a special assignment. Your assignment is to go to this secret location away from the rest of the audience. They are then met with a crew, by a crew member and told that they've been kicked off the show, basically. And uh, I also changed the original, the initial text that was sent out at 8 in the morning to, um, I added in the phrase, this is an interactive show, so you're asked to come with a playful and constructive attitude. Which really, I think, you know, we just got a random, unfortunate person, and this never needed to be used. But I wanted the crew and cast to feel safe, that this could never happen again, basically, or that if it did happen again, it would be dealt with immediately. Um, did, it, did it say on there that they would be, uh, take, they would be asked to go to a secret location to be, to be uh, extracted if they were level three? Uh, yeah, I, think I, would, I would think that they yeah. would be like, well, oh, I have a secret mission and I'm being a jerk, you know, and I'm like, I think I'm going to get kicked out of the show, you know? I don't think the participants were told what the triggers were to, to be, they were just told, hey, this is a... Well, the thing is, the nature of the show is it's all these secret assignments and you're told you're doing this special oh, event, so special right. thing. So they're so, constantly getting secret assignments, so it's like, yeah. just needs to part of the show. Yeah, yeah, okay. it would not seem odd in the context of this show okay. if you were told, you would actually think, oh cool, I get to do one of the cool things. Yeah. Yeah. When it's really, you get to yeah. the show. Yes. <laughs> oh, that age you die. <laughs> and so I basically, I decided that what I would say to them is, you know, your assignment is to find something that is more fun to do than frequency. Because I thought that, you know, that then go, well, screw you, there's lots of things more fun to do than frequency, and <laughs> off they go, you know, that, that would kind of um, hopefully prevent them from trying to just belligerently rejoin the show. Uh, but anyway, that all turned out to not be necessary. Um, so, so, yeah, how did, how did the other players identify that a person might have kicked out? Why would they? Um, the other player, no, no, this is for the crew and the mall. It's not for the other crew. Players. Oh, okay. So these players weren't really doing anything. It's the it's the people that were you know facilitating the game. They were like that guy's a jerk. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. And probably the audience was thinking that too. But you know it's really. Well, they're too much into the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, you know again, this is a good thing with the mob and and part of and basically the level one, two, or three. All the actors had code phrases that they could say, like the agent who was shot says I was shot one, two, or three times, that's the code phrase. So that's how he can communicate to them. Like, Mole can either tell me directly, someone needs a level two warning, or if the actor wants to call level two, he can do that through, and then Mole will then text me, you know, level two, to direct, and yeah. Um, so, the, they receive, a device that they have to put together, um, you know, put the, um, what was it, put, connect the, the circular particle sensor to the positron gun using the quantum field using stabilizer or something. So, yeah, so um, they connect it, when you, pull the, nice. when you pull the trigger the light comes on and um, this is again another key invisible witness um, event, as soon as the light comes on, they tell me and I start sending texts to everyone, tracking, tracking, signal coming from the east, and so on. So they're waving this thing around, <laughs> no sensors in it whatsoever, and they're being told where to go. And, and that was actually a really fun part of it for me, because... Um, <laughs> So and that was when I actually could see them because I was sitting in the truck and that was the first time they were close enough for me to spot them and it would be getting to twilight. I'd see the light go on and be, yes, my little 
happened to be my children. <laughs> so, and there's the truck. I am there. <laughs> so basically throughout the show, and in the back of the truck is a uh, secret agent base. And so they guided to the secret agent base, and in the, uh, the, and in the back, again, is the quantum rift is in the back of the truck, behind the secret agent base. Now this scene was actually going to happen in a bar, and I was going to have um, a box that people opened, and they had a whole bunch of stuff that explained things in the box. And this is again another thing where a problem turned out to have been useful, because um, I, I actually realised that even though the bar was happy to have us in there, they would not be happy by the end of the run with you know people constantly coming in and not buying anything and taking out tables. And I realised that that's actually a lot more fun to be in the back of the truck anyway. Um, so I had a baby monitor, I was listening in um, to what was happening in the truck. Um, there were more puzzles to solve um, in order to extract Sylvia from the quantum rift. Um, and there were, there were posters on the walls that kind of explained graphically a bit more about the miners and the resistors in case anyone didn't really understand what was going on. Um, while they Ah. And unexpectedly, um, the guy with the missing girlfriend shows up. By this point, everyone knows he's a secret, evil secret agent. And um, this is when uh, there was a conveniently placed rope, and when I was originally telling people about the show, I said, oh yes, and at this point the audience will tie up the secret agent with the rope, and people go, you expect an audience to tie up an actor with a piece of rope? And yes, they will, and yes, they did. So, <laughs> um, and it was really fun because I was in the front of the truck, and this guy would arrive, and suddenly this truck starts rocking, and this shouting going on, you're taking And um, so, and on, and then he gets tied up. Sylvia gets brought out of the rift. Um, I would have liked to do this with keyboards and um, uh, you know dials and things, but that was another. Th that was something that was in the two-part basket. So basically, they sent, they solved um, problems. They then sent settings to resist a command, so resist a command could release. Sylvia. Behind the rift was um, a crew member with a Bluetooth speaker um, playing sound effects, rift sound effects. So and she was already in the truck the whole time. She was in, well, and for like 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, and she was really like behind some, yeah. some Yeah, we actually had, like, it was really interesting because the audience would, um, they would have debates. Sometimes they would discuss whether or not to get her out of the rift. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs>
because I would get delivered the box into the front of the truck that had all the agent evaluation forms in them, and then I would frantically text to him as, as much feedback as I could, and he would then choose what to read out and sort of say, you know, um, your partner thinks you have a ridiculous hat, and so on. So, so, so yeah. uh, you were in the truck in the front, how come they didn't just see you in the front of the truck? Um, the, there was, the side was blacked off. Okay. You know, with just basically black piece of cardboard, the, the side window, and so they came around the side. Okay, so they, they, they couldn't see you inside. They couldn't see me, no. Yeah. So, we've got a few minutes for questions. Yes. So how, how much, how long was the overall experience? Two hours. So it's two hours. Roughly two hours. How many times did you do this? Uh, nine, we had nine performances. Oh. If you did it again, would you have a smaller group size or was the group size about right? I like, I think it was a good group size. It was enough to, yeah, it was a really good size and I wouldn't have wanted it to be bigger because I think it's small enough to sort of be intimate. Um, but again, it's enough size that you can break people off into two groups or whatever. So, yeah. And you did one a day. So, yep. every, so, so for nine yep. days, there was a text to hate and in the end, there would be a two hour thing and then yep. reset and you ready for the final. I have and, questions, I'm just trying yeah. to form um, And actually on the audience feedback, it was really, I have to say it was really glowing. Um, so I ended up keeping, I, I started a comments book after the first night, and because people were saying, you know, on the first night someone said, I wish this could have gone on all night, I really loved it. And we got a lot of comments of people saying that they wished, you know, I never want to leave this world, I wish it was twice as long, it was so much fun. And the thing that I was really pleased about was that the word fun Keep repeating because that was what I was going for. I was, you know, that you know that was the one experience that I wanted people to have. You know, I wasn't going for anything profound. I just wanted to give people a really good time. So if, if someone were to kind of repeat, not really the same that game or anything like that, really work, what kind of advice would you give to someone that's trying to plan something like this out, like an like interactive oh, adventure? Um, I'm sure there's some things that you. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah, understand the technology before you, before you set everything in motion, because I didn't. And so I was using Mighty Text and trying to, you know, trying to find an app to send multiple texts after I'd written the show. And so, the, you know, that then necessitated an emergency rewrite. And because basically I ended up going with just an iPhone and Bluetooth keyboard because, you know, I tried a couple of things and they turned out to have technical issues and I went, I cannot afford to have another technical fail. I will just do it, you know, a really simple way. Um, what other advice would I give? Um, How long did it take to plan it out? You know, like that kind of iteration of walking through the locations and then coming up with like How long did you take to do that? Um, gee, it's probably about three months. And then hiring the actors and having to tell them what to do and planning out yeah, all Yeah, and I should also say that the actors were all LARPers. Um, like, I wanted LARPers because I wanted people who were going to be really comfortable and experienced at the organization, and they were great. So Where did, how did you go about marketing? Was it something for a program or a flyer? Or? Um, yeah, I've got a flyer in here. Um, somewhere. Like were those just put up in like coffee houses? Or um, I the the flyers. Um, that's the flyer. Um, but actually, the Fringe Festival in New Zealand has really good um, promotions, so that was a lot of it. I did a couple of radio interviews, um, and yeah. Thank and you. Thank you. This is inspiring. Thank oh, so thanks. Much. Oh, hey, and if anyone has any questions later, at Red you know, Com, feel free to come and talk to me about it about the show. Um, I have yep. questions in my head. I still yeah, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> this is really insane. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yeah. What was the budget? I cannot disclose. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so. But it, like, it was not economic. I'll just say that. You know, like it was a it was a research and development thing. There was no way it was ever going to be economic with that small number. But I have to say that if you could bottle the enthusiasm that came off the audience. I would have made a fortune. So, yeah, so it was, it was really successful as proof of concept. 
Um, and you know, the next stage is to try and make it more efficient. Um, because I just tried to make it as cool as possible and sort of, you know, spare no trouble or expense or whatever, you know, just to make sure that it actually would work as a concept. And so now I found that it does. The next stage is to make it more efficient. So how, how did you? Uh, I would assume that after each successive uh, adventure, yeah. that the popularity would grow. Did we get to the point where, like, maybe eight or nine, we get because I don't know how many people wanted to be in. You know? Oh, it did sell out. Yeah, yeah it sold out so, really quickly. So uh, yeah. I sold out for like a small eight group of eight people. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. How much demand was it? I mean, did you did you did you ever gauge how many people like wanted to come in? Uh, no, I wish I could have, but you know, apparently, yeah, I kept hearing that people were trying to book and couldn't book, and they had a waiting list. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, and it, a lot of audience members said they were going to tell all their friends as well. So um, yeah, so it didn't happen very often. Yeah, Are you planning to do it again? I am, plan I am working on some other things that are going to be less labor intensive. In the short term, no, I'm not planning to do something with this natural again because it was really exhausting. And to make it viable, you would have to charge a fortune. But I think you could charge a fortune because people had so much fun. Um, but you know, initially, when no one had heard of it, you know, you couldn't obviously because you know you kind of need the word of mouth to get out there first. Do you think it's something that you could pipeline? So, for example, you could run several in one day. So, people meet, the first group go off, and then you give them like an hour of gap, and then a new lot come in. And so, the market. Yeah, yeah you, could, just you could in theory, although I have to say, you know, one show a night was quite exhausting for everybody. Well, so, but if you, you know, if you streamlined it, yeah, there's absolutely, there's no reason why you couldn't, although, well, there's one reason why you couldn't, if people took too long to get to a certain stage. But actually, in terms of how long they took, there probably wasn't more than 10 minutes difference between the slowest and the fastest group, which surprised me because you know this whole even things just like walking pace and you know conversations that you had, um, you know, make it unpredictable. But yeah, it I would. Tie something in some of the tourism group. Um, there's yeah. a lake in uh, Salem and uh, a lot of other towns where you go visit. Um, there. Businesses will pay for you their location to be a stop on your tourism group. So it would be a crossover to help mitigate some of that cost if it's, you know, they will be right in front of your shop. They will be mm. in your bar. They will go yeah. to those locations. Yeah. Um, actually, we had a couple of tourists from Chicago on honeymoon who did the experience. And um, they said, you know, great way to see Wellington. We're, you know, we're tourists from Chicago. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think definitely like the, you could run it as an on, you could run an ongoing thing like this as a tourist thing. Like it would, you know, making a show like this for tourists would be quite viable mm -hmm. um, because also you know what tourists want in a way that you don't know what individual locals want. You know, tourists want to see the city and they haven't seen it, so that kind of makes it quite simple to create something that is also going to have ongoing demand. Yeah. How much were the tickets for? Uh, they were really, they were fifteen dollars. Okay, so cheap. ridiculously cheap, yeah, for the experience. So yeah. Thank okay, thank you guys. Like I said, if you have any follow-up, you know, things you want to know, you know, and we later on kind of come away and have to talk. I was imagining all the all the logistics that have to go into this. Yeah. It just seems like and then try and tell a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. 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 Hats off to you, man. <laughs>